and everybody. Now I'm going to ask uh, Peter Manuel to come up onto the stage and as, as he does I would like to remind you that uh, up the back we've got uh, uh, membership forms for those who would like to join FLAG because as all of you, most, most of you know that Peter is the uh, uh, founder and the executive director of FLAG Australia and uh, Peter is absolutely uh, dedicated to the fact that we in Australia need to have pure green foods uh, grown in Australia, particularly in South Australia where we're under pressure from the government, the, uh, the South Australian government, and Peter's here to fight for all of us to have that plentiful food, that clean green stuff on our tables. So without further ado, I will ask uh, Pete to take the stage and, and uh, take over from here. Thanks very much, Lindsay, and welcome you all, and thanks very much for coming. Um, Lindsay, these days, since he's been retired, he goes down to South Brighton a bit and visits Julia Gillard, but we won't hold that against you, Lindsay. Um, a lot of people ask me, some of you might have heard this before, but a lot of people ask me, uh, just before I will start, I've got some manners here. I see uh, Brendan Hardman from the uh, Australian Defence Force Party here. Brendan, stand up. And uh, welcome, Brendan. Uh, I'll tell you now, mate, we, uh, we really appreciate what the veterans have done for this flame and country and the way they're being treated at the moment with closing the repat is absolutely disgusting. It really is. So uh, we'll keep fighting for them too, don't worry. So good on you, Brendan. I noticed uh, Richard Zachariah here tonight. Would you like to stand up, Richard? Uh, I'm sure uh, a lot of you would remember the home show that Richard and um, I'm allowed to say you've got a partner here tonight. Can I mention the other one yet? Uh, Chad and Maggie Tabra and uh, Richard used to do the home show in Sydney and that was a great show. But Richard is leading the charge in Victor Harbour uh, because in Victor Harbour Mr John Rao wants to do an out-of-town retail development like he wanted to do in Strathalbyn and Richard's leading the charge to uh, uh, try and stop that development, which will absolutely destroy the town centre of Victor Harbour. So, good on you. I just briefly just what flag flags about. Uh, flag stands for Food Producers Landowners Action Group Australia, and uh, food producers and landowner. Landowner is anybody with a house. That's anybody in the city because. You all pay a natural resource management levy on your rates. And what this natural resource management board is doing to us farmers, they're coming for you, don't worry. Because they're trying to control our lives and they'll try and control yours. So look out for that one. But uh, what FLAG is about, we're just, as Lindsay briefly said, we're about going about our business, running our farms, caring for the environment, and growing clean, healthy food for South Australia, Australia and the export market. And uh, when we look at our biggest money earner in this country is agriculture. It puts $155 billion a year into the Australian economy. And what have we got? If we look back over the years, the Liberal and Labor government, have a look where we are. We've got our biggest money earner being sold to overseas government investors and corporations. And I just can't believe that we've got a situation where, you know, they call it foreign investment. Uh, why would you sell your cash cow? Why would you sell your agricultural land and these people come over and buy it, grow the food, sending it back to their country and don't pay any tax? I just cannot, as a businessman myself, I cannot see how that is going to benefit this country. We are already net food importers on seafood and fruit and vegetables. Now, I can tell you now, if we can't supply ourselves with food, that puts us in a very vulnerable and dangerous situation. And the way the world's going at the moment, whoever supplies us with this food, this inferior food, uh, starts sanctions, we're in real trouble. Two years ago, uh, sorry, three now, uh, we had nine, sorry, two weeks supply of diesel left in this country. 
we now import 90% of our liquid fuel. And there's an old saying, you control oil, you control nations, you control food and water, you control the people. They won't need guns to take us over, I can tell you. I'm getting sick and tired of hearing these politicians talk about the lucky country. Well, I'm sorry, we're not the lucky country. We might be lucky compared to Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and all the rest of it. But a lucky country, their manufacturing's booming, their industry's booming, and their agriculture is booming. But I'm afraid our manufacturing's gone, our industry's gone, and now, through this environmental movement, the Natural Resource Management Board, the restrictions that are being put on us mum and dad farmers uh, is absolutely ridiculous. Restricting our water use, no more dams because of our precious resource water. Well, that's unreal. Because in the last few weeks, we've got a situation where there's an expor exploration licence uh, being granted uh, for Macclesfield Yandam gold mines, 56 square kilometres. How much water are they going to use? And yet we're being strict, restricted and we're growing a critical need. And what is it going to do to the landscape? And what about if our underground water gets contaminated and our surface water gets contaminated? Where in the hell is this NRM board supposed to be looking after the environment? No, look, I'm sorry, they're not an environmental movement. They're a mob of commas. And we are being run by a communist blasted party in this state. This Labor government is disgraceful what they're doing. Their cons consultation is up the creek. They couldn't give a stuff about consultation. It's dictatorship at its best. And if we have a look, as I just mentioned, about the REPAT hospital. You know, the REPAT, the veterans had 120,000 signatures. They just ignored it. Absolutely ignored it. Flag Australia are down in front of Parliament House every Monday, gaining signatures, opposing this right to take water levy on our farms. And we've got nearly 4,000 signatures now, opposing this right to take water, and they're mainly from city people. I'll never forget, I was having a chat with Isabel Redman, haven't seen her lately either. Um, and she said, oh look, you've got to get the city people on board. Well, we're getting the city people on board because the city people eat, and they want to eat clean, healthy food grown here in South Australia. We don't want to be eating the crap that's coming from overseas, that's con berries contaminated with hepatitis A, fish grown in raw sewage. Uh, sorry, we deserve better than that. We've had the privilege in our lifetime of eating clean, healthy food, and we want to protect that for our future generation. I just want to uh, say that... <laughs> this Labor government lately talk about a dining boom. Well. Where's the food going to come from with this dining boom? Because they're restricting us in every way possible to grow it. Uh, and uh, they're going to approve this mine. I mean, the dining boom, yes, but the food will be coming from overseas and that doesn't benefit this country. And if mum and dad farmers are allowed to farm, we will create the jobs, don't worry about that. But at the moment, with the restrictions that are put, on, put, on, put upon us, sorry, you know, we've got earth movers that can't come onto your farm and do another dam or, uh, you know, do something without... There's got to be an application. Seven applications to put a pipe in a waterway because it's a, an effective... Sorry, a water-affecting activity. This sort of rubbish has got to stop. And it's serious stuff. I wouldn't be here wasting five years of my life warning people what is going on. I've got other things I want to do. But I'm afraid, I can tell you now, if we don't stand up and be united, well, we're being shafted big time. And they're bringing it in very, very quickly, I can tell you. I mean, uh, we have a look at a situation where uh, about four years ago, a uh, farmer rang me up and he said, um, the NRM have estimated my dam at X amount of meg, I just can't remember what it was. And I said, well, look, what about getting your dam accurately measured, get a water surveyor? He said, I can't afford it. So Flag Australia put up the money, thousands it cost us, put up the money, we got this dam accurately measured and the good old NRM were a million gallons out. Overestimated the water in this dam a million gallons. This is the sort of rubbish that we're putting up with. The Flag money, your subscription money, what it does, 
We've just donated recently $1,000 to the Royal Flying Doctor Service. We donated $1,000 to the Tyler family who want people to have access to raw milk. Uh, whether you like raw milk or what, that's not the point. The point is you should have freedom of choice. And this is what they're taking away from us, our freedom of choice and our freedom of speech. If I can just let you know how much land uh, is sold recently, if we have a look at Hassad Australia, everybody talks about the Chinese. But don't worry, there's 62 other countries buying us. We've got Hassad Australia that bought $500 million worth of our agricultural land in Western Australia and the Eastern States. They bought a $9 million cattle station down the southeast recently. They're currently on the York Peninsula and Air Peninsula trying to buy up as much agricultural land as possible. In the last two months, the Chinese have bought $120 million worth of our agricultural land. There's a billion dollars in play at the moment that they could get, a billion dollars worth. This foreign takeover, not ownership, this foreign takeover has to stop. If they want any land and the farmer wants to do something with it, lease it. We do not sell our land. We're selling our sovereignty and that's not good enough. I mean, I'm getting sick and tired of these politicians. They get up and they rave on and, you know, they're only career blokes anyway, most of them. But, um, you know, they talk about jobs. I remember Tony Abbott raving on about jobs and, you know, what's his name? The other one over there, short and whatever his name is. Um, you know, raving on about jobs. We're going to create jobs. Well, how are they going to create these jobs? I'll tell you how you create jobs. We've got a, we've got a, a rabbit industry that we're poisoning rabbits. Poisoning these rabbits. Hang on. How about subsidising bullets for shooters to go out and shoot these rabbits? It's low in cholesterol, high in protein, and we can use the bloody pelts so R.M. Williams can make a Cuba hatch. But no, what are we doing? We're poisoning rabbits and we're importing flaming pelts from India. They're good business people. We've got a situation, and I think Rebecca might be able to... I don't want to put you on the spot, Rebecca, but bring up about this... Um, billionaire businessman that wants to put half a billion dollars into uh, keeping the car industry going. So you might be able to uh, enlighten us on that. Look, I, I won't talk any longer. I, I could go on and on and on, but look, believe me, uh, when I talk about the environmental movement, don't get me wrong, I care for the environment. I've got two creeks at home. They're pristine. I love the trees and all the, the, the nature and, and our animals and everything like that. And I want these native animals to come and drink freely from my creeks, freely from my dams. And, and we're not going to be able to do this, especially if this Yam Dan gold mine goes ahead in Macclesfield. And they're going to start off at 56 square kilometres. It'll go a hell of a lot further than that and be a hell of a lot bigger. So, again, thank you all very much. And uh, I'd like to welcome Rebecca Sharkey, who's running for the Nick Zafon team. <laughs> against good old Jamie Briggs. <laughs> And I'm sorry, Jamie, I can't stand you, mate. You're abusive, you're arrogant, and uh, this birdie is better looking anyway. Good on, you. Good on you, Rebecca, thanks a lot. Now, I'm not as tall as Peter, so I'll just um, lower the mic. Well, good evening. Um, Firstly, uh, I'd like to thank Peter Mendel uh, and Flag Australia for inviting me here tonight. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about myself. As Peter mentioned, I am the Nick Xenophon uh, team candidate for Mayo. And I've lived in Mayo for nearly 20 years. And with my husband Nathan, we operate a small business uh, in the construction industry. And we're also raising three children together, who are, our youngest is uh, 11 and our oldest is 16. So life in our house is a little bit crazy. So aside from uh, supporting Nathan with the operation of our business, I also work uh, on a contract, writing youth policy. And I've spent the last four years in the executive management in the youth sector, primarily focusing on ensuring young people successfully transition from school into employment. I'm a firm believer that if the first experience a young person has 
in entering into the workforce is joining the unemployment queue, then we as a country have failed them. I live in the north of the electorate, in the Torrance Valley area, and I'm involved in a number of organisations in my community, including being chair of the uh, Mount Torrance Soldiers Memorial Hall. I think in its 100 year history, I'm actually the first woman chair. It's a bit exciting. <laughs> My contact with Nick Xenophon started in early uh, 2014 when the program I was a National Executive Officer for, uh, called Youth Connections, faced defunding by the Federal Government. And I was particularly frustrated that while youth unemployment was increasing, the only Federal Government program that worked with 30,000 of Australia's most disengaged young people was facing the Axe. And Nick was not on the committee himself, um, but he worked with his Senate colleagues to enable me to present to the Senate Select Committee on the Abbott Government's proposed budget of 2014. And I was particularly struck by Nick's passion for South Australia and how, like me, he sees enormous potential for South Australia, not just negative headlines, that we're the worst unemployment state uh, rate in Australia, but we're the rust belt, as we're sometimes unkindly referred to. I talked to Nick about the lack of vision I was seeing from my federal members of parliament, that we've moved away from long-term planning for our nation to a three-year election cycle of policy planning, to bite-sized sound bites that sound good in the media, three-word slogans, and that now more than ever we need long-term planning, sensible, cautious, intelligent planning for Australia, and particularly for South Australia's long-term prosperity. I shared with Nick that I felt that our nation's parliament should be a contest of ideas, a place where there was a true representation for members to bring to the parliament the views of their electorate and where they, as the elected member, would contribute to the national debate for the betterment of their electorate, not their donors, not their party. And I complained about um, the long-term vision for the benefit of the people of Australia. We have, a, a, I think, a myopic short-term game playing, point scoring, to see between the two major parties who represent, who are our representatives, are largely career politicians who have never had a real job outside of the party. And so it's this long term vision that gave us superannuation. It gave us the universal health care that we all enjoy. It was this long term vision that had um, the floating of the Australian dollar, and under how Costello, the future fund. And this is what I think we are missing. And so, to cut a long story short, fortunately, Nick Zenfond didn't think I was crazy, although I was chatting with him about it today, and he thinks that um, he's a little bit crazy, and I'm a little bit crazy. And uh, instead, suggested that I consider standing for the seat of Mayo, where I love. So what followed after that was essentially a year-long job interview where collectively as a team we've worked together to develop our policies and I had to prove that I was worthy to be a candidate on our team and for Mayor. The Nick Xenophon team is based on three key principles. We are anti-predatory gambling. This has been a platform that Nick has carried since he first entered state politics in the 1990s. We believe in transparency in government and this includes all facets of government and political parties and extends to parliamentary entitlements and to political party donations. We believe every dollar paid by the Australian taxpayer should be accounted for in a timely manner. And finally, we believe in Australian land and I think this is our most important principle. We believe we make the best, we grow the best and so we should support our own industries to flourish. government spends $39 billion a year annually on procurement, which is essentially running the day-to-day -day business of government. And we believe that every dollar possible should be spent on Australian grown and Australian produced products, whether that's our steel, our paper, the lot. And just this week we supported the South Australian government's support our steel policy, which we believe should be a nationwide effort. We need to keep making steel in Wyoming. It's as simple as that. A country that does not make steel it falls into being a third world country. We can be the masters of our own economic destiny. 
As a party, we are not beholden to big business or the unions, and this allows us the freedom to make decisions that are in the best interests of Australians and not our own vested interests. Nick Xenophon likes to joke that because we don't read donations, we are operating not on a shoestring budget but a dental floss budget. And <laughs> he's completely true then. But it costs nothing to knock on doors. It costs nothing to chat with people about what matters to them. And so that's the focus of our efforts. And so that's a little bit about me and the Nick Xenophon team. Now I most certainly do not stand here, I do not stand here thinking I have all the answers and nor am I across every issue in South Australia or in Mayo. But here are some of the issues that are on my mind. Without a doubt, South Australia, and in particular the Mayo electorate, which borders the Barossa and incorporates the Adelaide Hills, Fleurio and Kangaroo Island regions, are some of the best parts of Australia. Our regions have enormous potential to play a very important role in Australia's future prosperity. However, as a state, we are facing some very big challenges. We are in a state of transition. As a state, we have for generations been relying on a solid manufacturing industry, and our population is not growing at the same rate as the eastern states, and our population is rapidly ageing. And our ageing population, I believe, is our biggest challenge. We have the highest unemployment rate in the nation, our youth unemployment rate, in some places in South Australia, around 20%. That's really a hidden figure. Because as soon as a young person, or in fact any person, is working just one hour a week, they're off the unemployment rate. So realistically, when you combine youth unemployment and underemployment, you're talking about one in three young people. The reality is, if we want to have an Australian workforce and if we want to ensure older Australians can be well looked after, we need to ensure, we need to invest that we have full youth unemployment, not double the mainstream unemployment rate, which is currently where it is. And contributing significantly to our youth unemployment is the reality that every year fewer and fewer entry-level jobs exist. A few weeks ago I was in a park in Stirling. I was waiting for Channel 10 to arrive for an interview and I saw three young men, I think in their early 20s, and they were sitting on a park bench. So I went and introduced myself. And of course I'm sure they were delighted to have this middle-aged lady come wandering up to them and wanting to talk to them. But anyway, uh, we got chatting and uh, they were a little bit sad. Um, they were three best friends, they'd been three best friends since primary school and their worlds were changing and they had little control over it. The first young man was heading to Melbourne, the course he wanted to study that combined engineering and urban planning wasn't offered in South Australia. And he wanted to stay home. He didn't know anyone in Melbourne and he didn't like the place much and he didn't barrack for a Victorian team. <laughs> uh, the second young man had finished his engineering degree. He applied for countless jobs here but he was about to get on the plane as the only job he could get was in Perth. The third young man will finish his university degree this year. He was already concerned about how he was going to find a job here in South Australia and he didn't know whether he was going to need to head east or west. And I, I felt really angry about this. I was really sad. Um, they love living in South Australia. They love Stirling where they grew up. And this is... Uh, where their families are, this is where they belong. And the tragedy for us, the tragedy for South Australia, is that we are losing our best and our brightest young people. And even when they don't want to go, they've been pulled interstate because that's where the jobs are. And we all know very few return. So when I left school, I had lots of options. The university was cheap. If you wanted to start earning money, you set public service or a banking tree exam. There were factories and offices all needing lots of keen people. You didn't need experience or qualifications. You could become a girl Friday, you could fill a filing clerk position, or you could be a junior hand in a factory. All were a start, all paid you money, and all led to somewhere. So those jobs I mentioned, they don't exist anymore. And if you think about your first job, I'm sure for many in this room, it wouldn't exist anymore either. So we need to address the lack of opportunities for young people if we want to address the effect of our ageing population. It's one thing to change the vocabulary. 
and to include words like innovation and agility and being nimble, and they're all favoured by our Prime Minister Turnbull. What does it really mean when you've sold the farm and you've closed the factories? Despite the challenges of Australia, South Australia's ageing population and our declining manufacturing industry, I am an optimist. And I believe we have the potential for a very exciting future. But decision makers need to act now. <coughs> and I believe the success of our future will rest on our reputation and ability to produce high quality food and our ability to produce renewable energy. So what could our future look like? This week, our nation's population ticked over to 24 million people. This mark has reached 17 years than early predicted. And by the year 2050, our world population will be 10 billion people. That's just vast. Asia, our nearest neighbour, is expected to be 5.2 billion of that global population, so over half. So what are our challenges and opportunities? I don't think I need to emphasise that 10 billion people on this planet is a lot of people to feed. South Australia's agriculture and our ability to produce some of the best quality food in the world will be our greatest asset. In South Australia, our agricultural industry has been overshadowed by mining and it's worth noting that in 2015, just 12,700 people in South Australia were employed in the mining industry compared to over 40,000 in agriculture, forestry and our fishing industry. And predominantly the majority of those people were employed in the agricultural and primary production. Nationally, in 2012, the National Farmers Federation stated there were 134,000 farm businesses in Australia and that each farmer produces enough food to feed 600 people, 150 at home and 450 overseas. Australian farmers produce almost 93% of Australia's daily domestic food supply. Australian farmers export around 60% of what they grow and produce, and in 2010-11, our farm experts, exports earned our country $33 billion. I think that deserves a round of applause. Agriculture plays a vital role in Australia. It significantly contributes to our social, economic and environmental sustainability. But, back to the future I was talking about. With a global population of 10 billion people and projected national population of 42 million, what will South Australia look like in 2050? And so we need to look at our ABS stats to, uh, to give us a bit of a picture. If we go back a decade to 2007, Australia had a population of 14.5 million people were aged less than 50 years and only 1.6 of the population was aged 85 years or over. In the year 2050, that percentage of 1.5 is expected to increase to nearly 7%. Most critically though, the greatest challenge we will face will be our workforce participation rate. Again, a decade ago, as a nation, we had five working people for every person over 64 years, and this will shrink to just three people. For South Australia, we are the oldest mainland state, and we will feel the effect of this even more, and especially in Mayo, because Mayo is uh, the oldest out of all of our electorates. Victor Harbour is the state's largest town, is our uh, largest town with a population of over 75 years, Goolwa and Mount Barker are also in the top 10 of the oldest townships. And I think it's worth pointing out here that while we have high quality food and water, our, farm pop our farmers population is also ageing. Australian farmers are considerably older than other workers. In 2011, the median age of farmers was 53 years and just 13% of farmers were aged 35 years or younger. So we need to sure, ensure as an industry it is attractive for young people to enter primary production. We need to ensure there are entry points for young people to build primary production businesses and that they are rewarded for the work that they do and they have surety of the ability to farm in the future and this, most importantly, is the ability to access water. I would like to see the Turnbull Government's Ideas Boom have a regional rural focus 
I believe there's great scope, particularly for young people to develop new businesses in farming and food production. The challenge of our agricultural industry, and indeed farmers, will be to meet the booming need for food, both in Australia and globally. Naturally, the expected increase of Australia's population will put greater pressure on the encroachment of arable land by urban sprawl and can meet competing demand for water. Our policy makers need to ensure that the policies that they implement support our primary production industry and not make it harder to remain on the land. With a growing, gro growing, sorry, with a growing global population, and as developing nations become wealthier with an emerging middle class, we will also face the increasing pressures that Peter talked about of foreign ownership of our most arable land. The rest of the world will be looking to feed its own countries, and the investment in Australian farmland has, considered, has increased considerably in the last decade. Essentially, they will want our farmland. There's no doubt about it. Until recently, the Foreign Investment Review Board threshold was set at $249 million. This has been lowered to $15 million um, before the board needs to approve the sale of a property. We believe the threshold is too high and is a failure to protect our sovereignty. I'm not against foreign investment in Australia per se, but we need to accept that once we sell the farm, it will be near impossible to ever buy it back. So Nick Xenophon has been very vocal on this issue and he's moved amendments to the bill that would see scrutiny of foreign ownership step in at agricultural land purchases valued at $5 million. Nick Xenophon has referred to the Senate, in the Senate, to the New Zealand Framework for Foreign Investment Review, which is efficient and clear. The New Zealand model includes a number of set criteria for national interest to take into account and the purchase effect on jobs, technology transfer, transfers, and what the impact will be on the market and the sector more widely. In New Zealand, the national interest test is applied to every prospective foreign investment or ownership sale where the property exceeds five hectares of non-urban land. It's quite different to us, isn't it? There is no doubt that as our world population increases, the interest and pressure of foreign ownership on our best land will increase. And I would like us to consider a further safeguard, which would provide a 90-day window for agricultural sales to prospective foreign investors to allow a majority Australian-owned business or individual to find the funds to match the sale. A prospective sale would need to be advertised in public notices so that we know about it. Because what's happening now is we're finding out after the event that a property sold to China, that it's sold to Malaysia, etc. By placing the impending sale in public notice and giving a 90-day hold to a range of domestic sale, we will give the best opportunity of prime agricultural land remaining in Australian hands. And this will ensure we have the ability to reap the rewards of sharing our produce with the rest of the world and ourselves for generations to come. So in closing, we face great challenges, but also great opportunity. But we need that opportunity to be seized by decision makers who will consider the needs of South Australia first, not their faction, not their party, not their donors. And I'm honoured to be part of the Nick Xenophon team, as I believe if we have if we are supported by the people of South Australia, the ability for us to demand South Australia to be counted in Canberra will happen. And we can no longer rely on the politics of the past to set a pathway for our future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and uh, that was pretty informative, and uh, you reckon you were going to speak for five minutes, good. <laughs> Not bad. Right. Yeah, and, uh, Rebecca, I, I think uh, if Nick Xenophon team could really look at a right to farm bill, uh, that's, that's what we need. We've got a situation, sorry, we've got a situation where, you know, we've got people coming up from town buying, you know, these subdivisions going on and all the rest of it, 
and all of a sudden, you know, we might be weaning our calves, and somebody says, oh, these poor flaming calves, you know, this moon. Well, it goes on for three or four days, and that's what we do. Well, we might want to be cutting hay at one or two o'clock in the morning. It was too hot during the day. We need protection to be able to grow this food. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to do it.